listening to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Hey, welcome to episode 54 of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger alongside Frank Saravalli. We are coming to you live once again from the woodjerseys.com studio. And uh, they have uh, more jerseys by the day. Check out woodjerseys.com. Got the Boston Bruins. Frank, of course, has his uh, Toronto Maple Leafs one. It is an official licensed product of the National Hockey League. So you know it's authentic. You know it's great. Check it out. See all the new jerseys in all the colors at woodjerseys.com. Frank, I hope you're doing great. Now, I want to be very upfront with all of our uh, podcast listeners. Uh, We're taking a little time off. So we recorded this last week uh, with Andrew Cogliano, who, of course, just signed with the San Jose Sharks, Frank. And now we'll get to our uh, big guest delivered by DoorDash. If you've yet to have DoorDash, it delivers all food and everything else to your home. You can go online, get the app, use the promo code RUNDOWNDD, and first-time users of the app will get 25% off and free delivery pretty sweet deal get your favorite meals delivered right to your door as our uh, guest today was the uh, 25th pick back in uh, 2005 he's one of only six players from his draft class to have played over a thousand games he owns the nhl record for most consecutive games with an overtime winning goal and he's now a member of the san jose sharks andrew cogliano joins us cogs how you doing welcome to the show good guys thanks for having me Good. Now you're, of course, uh, you got two young kids, uh, two and and six months. So uh, I noticed you've went to the tranquility of your bedroom. How often do you find yourself just going for a little peace and quiet in your room as a young dad? You know what? I'm actually, I actually flew home to Toronto for for a couple of weeks. So um, I'm getting a good break from the from the kids, which is um, which is probably much needed. But um, no, it's been great. We've been at our cabin out in. Uh, uh, in Vermeer, BC for the past, you know, for the whole summer. So, uh, we've had some good family time. I'm just back home for a couple of weeks. Okay. I love it. Now, yeah. uh, before we get to some hockey stuff, um, Olympics are going on now. You're a pretty fast skater. Can you run? Like, were you, were you doing any track and field as a youngster? And if so, what did you excel at? You know what? I'm a good sprinter. So I don't think that's probably far off of how I play the game. You know, I've always, uh, I, I did track when I was younger. I remember being in track meets and, and um, doing track in, in high school at St. Mike's and stuff like that. But, um, you know, impressive. You know, today was, you know, we, we caught we caught uh, the grass there, um, you know, the race. And, you know, you watch you watch them run and you watch how those guys move. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. I actually, you know, at a young age, I think that was the one thing that really helped me with, with hockey. You know, people ask me about um, – you know, I've, I'm obviously a pretty gifted skater and they asked me about that a, a lot. And I never really did a lot of hockey schools or skating schools or skating instructors and instructing. Actually, I did a lot of track when I was younger. I, um, there was a, there was a high school teacher at our school that, um, qualified the Olympic for the Olympics in, in triple jump. And at around 14, we started doing some stuff out on the track and he taught me kind of the movements of, uh, you know, basically what track track guys do and track athletes. And, I actually think that's the one thing that probably helped me with my speed and my movement was, was learning those things. Um, and it's still something I enjoy. You know, I actually, I would love to go just watch track guys and track athletes uh, and track people train because I think it's pretty phenomenal. Well, I, I think it's also a great example, Andrew, of um, sometimes this early development and specialization in sports is, is not really beneficial to a lot of kids. And you're just, you, you learn how to move in different planes and different sports. And ultimately, you know, if you're a really good athlete, it'll translate into hockey. And you also, you, your body doesn't get worn out. I think mentally you don't get worn out. And I think we're slowly starting to see a shift there or more we should, because it's funny how so many players we talk to, how they weren't, you know, one sport athletes at a young age. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think now, you know, unfortunately that's just the craze of hockey, you know, especially in, in, in Canada, it seems like kids play, play hockey all year round. And, um, and if they think they're not playing hockey, they think they're falling, falling behind. I always played soccer. You know, I played soccer. I, I dropped the, the hockey equipment off when I was done after the year, I played soccer until, until August or September. And then I picked up hockey again. So I don't know, maybe it kept me mentally fresh and, and, uh, 
it made me more of an athlete and got me involved in other situations and sports. And, and for me, I thought it helped. Andrew, you mentioned that you were back in Toronto. My guess is you're there training. And I was just curious how much your training has changed over the years. Like just thinking back to all the sort of different trends we've seen just since you've entered the league, like for the longest time, there was that, you know, that strength portion that everyone, you know, was trying to get to and not that strength isn't important, but it just seems like the last few years specifically, there's been such a transition to agility, mobility, flexibility, all those different things that have really sort of changed the outlook and how guys focus on their training in the summer. Yeah, I I think things have definitely evolved. Um, You know, it seemed like it was always, you know, when I was a young guy coming up, it was always, you had to gain weight. You know, that was everything. That's all I would hear from scouts and you'd hear from people that you, uh, if you met with teams, you had to add, you had to add weight, you had to add weight. I, 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 you know, my belief now with that is I think you have to be strong and I think your body is going to be at the weight it wants to play at, but I think you have to move properly. You know, uh, if you do, if you don't move, um, you know, the right way, you don't focus on speed, you know, firstly, you're not going to be fast enough to play in the league, but also you'll probably get hurt. And, um, I, I think things have definitely evolved into, uh, taking care of your body more nutrition and, and, and also, like I said, is, 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 is doing things out of the weight room. You know, if it's on the track, if it's movement, movement prep, if it's, uh, working on agility and speed and, you know, the game has just changed, but, um, it seems like every year I try to pick a thing that I think I can get better at. And that's what I've always done. And, um, sometimes it's strength, sometimes it's speed, but, it seems like a lot of younger athletes now are definitely tailoring towards that way for sure. Mm -hmm. You, you signed in, in San Jose and it actually got me thinking back to your career path. And I noticed that you've spent your entire career in the West Edmonton, Anaheim, Dallas, and now San Jose being from Toronto, not a Maple Leafs question, but did you have any pull at all to, you know, to play in the East where a lot less time on the plane, a little bit of a different style of game at times. Was there any, thought in your mind as a free agent that you might want to try out the East? Yeah. Yeah, there was, I, I think, you know, how I approach a free agent, the free agent thing, you know, I've been very fortunate. First of all, like at the end of the day, um, this was my true first time being a free agent. So, you know, I think for, for a guy like myself um, to experience that basically this, this past season for the first time is, I mean, you know, I'm pretty fortunate. Um, I just went with, you know, I, 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 took the situation as who really wants me. And that's basically what I, what I, uh, what I thought about, you know, there are a couple of teams that, um, you know, I think, you know, would have interest and maybe the East would have been a situation where there'd be a different type of game to experience. But, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very familiar with the West. I think that's one thing that, you know, just by playing there, the teams there, how, how the, the teams play and, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's nice weather or California, but I like the uh, um, the Pacific Division has been very good to me when I was in Anaheim. So, um, but you know what, San Jose, they were a team that expressed, uh, you know, just interest right at right, right from the beginning. Um, they seemed like a team that had a plan for me right from the beginning and wanted me. And you know, I think in in the grand scheme of things, as a player, that's all you want. You want a team that has a plan, and you want a team that wants you. And I felt that right from the beginning from them. And, And at the end of the day, that's why I chose to go there. How, and this was your first time through it, Andrew. So do they outline, you know, I look at your career and they say, okay, we're, we're going to want you, you know, as a veteran, you know, third line player who, who can, they got some young forwards in that team saying, Hey, this is where we want you know, you're going to play maybe more defensive zone starts possibly like, do they go that in depth about what their plan is with you? Yeah. I I think they, they talked about a few things. I think they, they talked Mm -hmm. about, um, you know, they felt like last year, uh, Kachur and Hurdle, you know, took a lot of the brunt in terms of, you know, uh, offense and defense. Um, and sometimes for guys that play are expected to provide offense when you have to take all the defensive load and, and be in all defensive situations, it takes a lot out of them and sometimes takes away from the offensive game. So I think they were looking for some guys that are experienced in those situations, have been there before, um, you know, can defend uh, defend and play the right way. And, and, and I think for me, I think, you know, they, they looked at me as a guy that if I, if they have some younger players that, um, you know, need a veteran guy to play with, um, they looked at me as an opportunity to do that, you know, and, and I feel comfortable doing that. I've actually enjoyed that over the last couple of years, you know, younger players that I've played with, 
Um, was he was you know his last year? I played with a guy named Rhett Gardner some games and Ty Delandria. Um, and I, I think my biggest asset is I could communicate well. You know, I talk a lot on the ice. Um, I talk a lot before the games and in between periods. And you know, sometimes for young guys, that helps. That helps um, make them feel comfortable. That helps them have a plan and a process during the game. And um, and also helps me because they're young and they should have all the energy. So um, you know, hoping if that's the role, I think. You know, I could be, uh, I'd do a decent job at it for sure. Now, Andrew, here we are. It's it's 2021. You were drafted in 2005. Uh, 2005. Uh, it seems like a long time. You're now, you know, suddenly that wily veteran guy in the room. But I want to go back to, to your early days, you know, in Edmonton specifically. When you came in, you know, you and Sam Gagne came in as young guys together. I think you were 20 years of age when you broke into the league. So, you know, young and wide-eyed and just happy to be there. Who, who are veterans that helped you, you know, not just on the ice, but maybe off of the ice those first few years in Edmonton? Um, you know what? I, I think, you know, there's three three big guys that really, um, really stand out. Uh, Sean Horkov, uh, Steve Steos, and uh, Ethan Morrow. You know, I think... Ethan gave us his house the first year. Um, you know, Steve would let us, you know, Steve would have, a, Steve would basically do everything that we do, what I do with young guys now. You know, uh, you know I, we would go over their house, play with the young, the, their young children. And um, and that's what I have guys come over my house now and do the same thing. So, um, uh, and Hork, you know, I've, I've known Hork. I've had a good relationship with Hork now, you know, from the beginning, you know, till now I still talk to him, um, you know, on a weekly basis. So, uh, those three guys, you know, I, I think the biggest thing with them is they were easy guys to watch and follow. Um, you know, they were just professionals. You know, they 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 trained hard. I would go out to L.A. with them in the summers and train with with those guys with Stoli and Green and, and Hork. And, um, but you could tell they were just old school. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm to be honest, I'm very fortunate that I came in that era. Uh, I was a young guy in that era. I, I feel very lucky that. Um, you know, you, you be around guys that approach the game, uh, in an old school way and, and they prepared the right way. They played hard and, um, and they're a great teammate. So, um, that's one thing I've taken with me this whole time. And, um, and now it seems like I do the same thing for young guys on, on my team. You know, I, me and my wife, Allie, we, we take pride in, in, in helping younger guys and, and having them over and make them feel comfortable and, um, I think that's the one thing I could give back because that was what was done with me. So now you said, Ethan Morrow, you lived with him and his wife, Ornella, or you and, and it was you and Gagne, or did he just give you the house and he lived in another house? Uh, we we rented their their house, but I don't even know how much we rented it for. It must have been pretty cheap. It was me, Gags, and Gibby for our, uh, our first year. So okay. they had another house. They were living in, I think it was Comrie's dad's house. They, they were okay. renting that, you know, for a while there. And then we had a place out in, uh, he gave, we had the house that he kind of lived in before. So now how is that as, as you three, who is, who is the chef? Who is, who was just like the tough guy? Cause you, you, you'd been in college there for a few years. So I don't yeah. know if you lived well, in Gib dorms or not, but how was that with uh, Gilbert and, and Sam Gagne? Gibby was the oldest, right? By, he must've been what, four or five years older than us. So, had the uh, he had hair. the master bedroom, right? He had the master bedroom and, uh, and he was the dad, you know, he was the dad, but he did all the things like he played video games all the time and he was always watching movies. So he did all the things like kids would do, but, but he, uh, but he, he was definitely the, uh, the father figure and, you know, we had a great time, you know, you can't think of a better situation of playing, playing with guys, living with guys, and, um, you know, those, yeah, those years were, were, were amazing. So, you know, as simple as that. So probably not any shock to you, Andrew, you know, with Steve and, and Sean still having really active roles in the game, always dangerous to ask this question to a guy that's still playing and still has a lot left to give, but have you given any thought to what you might want to do down the road and, and would it still be in hockey? Yeah. You know what, for sure. You know, I've, you know, I, I think I've been able to play as long as I've had because I've been proactive. Um, I've always been a guy that's evolved and always been a guy that's kind of, try to have once you know be one step ahead and and for me you know you know there's gonna be a day where you just won't play hockey you know that's just simple as that I think that that day hopefully it's not for a couple of years but you know you have to start preparing for that and and thinking about that and um and in order not to be caught off guard you have to 
give some some thoughts to that. So, you know, for me, I, I love the game. I just do. I love everything about it. Um, you know, it seems like I gravitate to guys that love the game as well and 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 think, you know, like coaches or like managers. And um, and it's something that, that I definitely, um, as, you know, I think about it. I want to get involved in. You know, I don't know about coaching. Coaching seems tough to me. Coaching, you know, it just seems like it's a lot of uh, a lot of work and it's the grind. And, um, and I don't know if that is something that would interest me down the line. But, you know, management something that, you know, if it's working with young players to start, if it's uh, being a part of a group to help a team get better, uh, you know, that's something that I've definitely given thought to and, and, and I think would, ex- would ex- excite me. So, um, no, I, 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 yeah, I have. And, you know, like I said, I, I feel good right now. Hopefully I got a couple more years and of some good effective hockey and help some teams um, have success and then go from there. You mentioned that you gravitate to guys that love the game like you do. I've always wondered this, you know, spending time really close around teams as a beat reporter. It seems like there's always a couple guys on every team that maybe aren't in love with the game at that moment. Can you, as a player and a teammate, can you tell when, when a guy is like sort of falling out of love with it or it's become more of a, a job than anything else? Um, yes and no. I, I think you have different personalities in the game. I think you get some guys that, um, you know, they like just being on the ice and then they like leaving the rink, you know, and, and that's it. You know, you don't talk to them about hockey. You don't, uh, they're not interested in really um, a lot outside of just getting to the rink and playing and putting their gear on. And, and, and some guys are like that and all the power to them. I, I feel like I've always been a hockey guy um, and I've always really put everything I've gotten into it. And, and maybe that's why I gravitate to, to those guys a lot. And, and, because we're always talking about it. So uh, I don't know, but, but yeah, I, I think that's what makes the game special. I think you get different personalities and, and sometimes guys play better like that. You know, I think at the end of the day, I think there's guys that they don't want to be totally, um, you know, I'm filled with hockey. Yeah, exactly. All day long. Cause I think for them, they don't, they don't play as well. And I, I you know, to be honest, I've actually noticed that with myself, you know, I used to be a guy that, would watch hockey all the time, game after game, after game, after game. And, you know, about two or three years ago, I kind of like, just, I just stopped, you know, I just said, you know what, I'm just going to focus on my game. I'm going to have fun at the rink and focus on what I'm doing and play. And, and I kind of noticed it just took a little bit of pressure off. It helped me kind of do what I was doing. And, um, and sometimes it works. Sometimes, sometimes it's a lot. And if you, if you approach it like that, it could be too much. Your approach, Andrew, you played 830 consecutive games, which is the sixth most all time. And then you got your streak snapped by one of the most bogus suspensions. I think uh, most people (laughs) would agree in NHL history. I'm sure it probably still annoys you uh, to this day, Uh, (laughs) but any, any secret sauce to be able to play that many consecutive games? Like, are you a yoga meister? Are you Pilates? Like, what are you doing? Because obviously there's, there's a little bit of luck, but there's gotta be a lot of preparation. Yeah, you know, there's luck. I, I will, I'll give it that first. There's luck. Um, I don't know. Like, I think for this, for a lot of the time, I think I'm hard on myself. I think that is one thing that, you know, maybe when I step back at one point, um, I'll give some credit to is I'm just hard on myself in terms of how I prepare and, and how focused and detailed I am in my preparation. If it's the off season, if it's in season, and you know, sometimes I get glimpses of that when I'm around other guys and other players where, you know, I just noticed that sometimes what I'm doing is, is, you know, a little bit more than the next guy. You know, I'm just going to be honest. And I think that shows in the, the career I've had. Um, so, you know, but, I, but I've also enjoyed a lot of the stuff that helps you play long. You know, I, I enjoy the nutrition side of it. Um, you know, the training, the, the treatment side of it. I've always been a guy that's kind of uh, gravitated towards that. I've always been a guy that have, has helped players in that mode too and, and give them advice in terms of that so um i don't know i think it's kind of a perfect combination but i don't know i just feel like i'm a hard-working guy i feel like i just want to play and you know it seems like it's been a perfect recipe sometimes for all that yeah well it's obviously uh, what you're doing is working so you definitely don't want to change it i do want to get your thoughts as somebody who, who came in the league in 2007 till now and Recently, I was looking up some numbers, and this past season, the Columbus Blue Jackets set an NHL record for fewest power play chances per game in the NHL history. 
And then Anaheim was second lowest and Buffalo was sixth, and the Islanders were ninth. Like that's four of the, the lowest ninth all time as you've watched and played. And I've always felt like, you know, eventually it's going to be up to the players. If they feel the game, just, you know what, there's too much that's letting go. And I, I know it's not like it was prior to the lockout where guys were water skiing and hooking all over the place, but as somebody who's gone through it and you do think there's, there's the, does there need to be a little bit of a, of a reset as far as just maybe just calling the rule book, do you sense that as a player on the ice? Yeah, sometimes, you know, I, you know, I, I think the refs, you know, I know last year they took a lot of heat and I think there was a lot of flack out there for, you know, I, I, I think it's a tough job. I think, oh, yeah. you know, the more, you know, like it's just when I'm out there and you know, you got guys screaming at them and you got, it, it just, there's a lot that goes into it that I think people don't realize how hard it is. Um, I, you know, uh, my opinion just on refing in general is, is I just like erring on the side of less penalties. I, I just do. Like, I, okay. I feel like when we play games and, and there's a couple things that are let go both ways, whatever, you know, I, you know, you just kind of, I don't mind that. I kind of like that. I rather that than the other way. You know, when I feel like there's too many penalties, then just guys aren't in the game. Um, the power plays out there way too much. And you know, it's just not really enjoyable that much, you know, for the power play guys it is, but um, it just takes the rhythm, the rhythm out of it. But I've always felt the best refs, the guys that, you know, really have a good pulse of the game, you know, the odd thing, they just let go both ways. And it seems like when they do that early in the game, things kind of just evolve where there's just not that many penalties called. So I think we just need to get back to that a bit. I think, you know, the games where you get eight penalties a game, it's just, I don't know. I think sometimes you're giving teams automatic wins with good power plays. You know, they just win games more, right? It's interesting. Do you think, Andrew, you'd be in the minority in terms of that opinion, or do you think most of your teammates would feel the same way? Uh, who, I don't know. You know, it's a good question. I, I, that's a, I think power play guys probably want it the other way. I think, um, yeah. I think there's, you know, I, I'm sure there's players in the league that get, you know, abused out there more than I do, you know, that want more penalty calls. Um, I, I don't know. I just, for me, I like five on five. I've always thought it, it's the most effective hockey. I think it's the most exciting hockey. Um, it's probably the truest think, test of hockey, right? Exactly. And I think you just get the best caliber, you know, when five on five is played consistently and you have guys playing all four lines or in the game. And, you know, when there's too many penalties, you know, you basically have the same guys out there the whole time. Um, you know, there's a balance, but, you know, I, I, that's what I think. I, I, I just, I feel like in playoffs, that's why I think playoffs sometimes is the most exciting is because there's not that many penalties called sometimes. Uh, well, that I noticed that a couple of years ago for sure. And it just seems like the pace is high and you're going up and down the ice and there's four lines playing and, and I think it adds to the game. Have you ever played on a team with a season that went as sideways as it did last year in Dallas? I mean, from... <laughs> The start uh, from COVID to just, you know, a short turnaround somewhat from, you know, playing in the bubble to getting started late. Um, the natural disaster that you guys experienced in Dallas, the condensed schedule that followed after that, like the injuries that you guys had, it just yeah. seemed like you could never really get on the same page. Yeah, it was tough. You know, I, it's too bad because I think we, uh, oh, I, I know we had a good team, you know, so I think it just was great from the beginning. We had guys with COVID, about 18 guys. Um, some guys didn't feel well, feel well at all. You know, and a lot of those guys that got it, um, you know, they came over. They didn't skate that much before they had to take the 10 to 14 days. Um, you know, and then we kind of started the season. And, and then the winter storm, which it was, more, it was just a tragedy for the entire state. You know, it was just something that no one's ever seen before there. Um, and you know what, it, you know, you know, I like, you know, how I saw the season was there was breaks for teams. Like I saw some teams get five, six break days break, and that was kind of our break. But to be honest guys, like it was no break. Like yeah. the, the day on the day of the game, we played Nashville. I woke up in the morning. It was, I got a newborn baby, um, and a young daughter. It was 59 degrees in the, in the house. You know, I'm going to the rink to pregame skate. My wife's at home wondering what to do she's in bed and then 
you know, we go play that night and then the game gets canceled. And then my wife is at another guy's house in the dark because no one had power. And then we end up spending five days, four or five days at Jamie Ben's house, two families of us, which, you know, you know, Jamie was, you know, you know, an amazing guy, an amazing person, but you know, you have two families with five kids running around his house and, you know, there just wasn't a break. So you come out of that and then you're just chasing it. It just felt like it was a year where we were just completely chasing it. Um, Rupe Hintz was hurt all year. We lost Radulov. Um, and yeah, it was one of those things where you just couldn't get any stability, you know? No Bishop, no Sagan. I mean, it was like... Yeah. Yeah. And, and Doby was, he came back and he was hurt to start the, the camp and he had a miss camp a little bit. And um, and Sagan, you know, say he's our top line center, right? So we didn't have him for the whole year. But losing Rads during the year really kind of hurt, I thought, because he was a guy that drove the offense pretty well. Um, and Rupe, who was probably one of our best players, was... He was playing on one leg pretty much the whole year. So I think it was, if it, you know, the big reason why we kind of kept kind of sputtering along was Robertson. You know, he came in and played really well um, and gave us a lot of points and put a lot of goals on the board. So he was a big reason why we kind of got where we even were. So I know they've made some changes, you know, adding some players, obviously someone like you departs, but someone tweeted out their potential lineup the other day. And I was like, damn, like that team yeah. could be really good. Would that surprise you at all to see Dallas right back in the mix? No, I think they're going to be really good. You know, I, I and, uh, you know, that's how it goes. You know, unfortunately, I won't be there, but um, I think they're a really good team. I think they're going to be solid. I'm sure that the additions of Suter and, and even a guy like Glenn Denning, and, um, you know, I, I just think their team is, I think they've really come along and they now know how to win. And I think Bones is a really good coach and, um, I think guys play for him there. I think Jim, you know, Jim just runs a great operation there. You know, I, I, I think it was, it was amazing playing for a guy like Jim Nill, just the, you know, you, you, you have a, a manager like that who you could feel the genuine, um, compassion of, of wanting guys to play well and wanting guys to be at their best. And I felt that. And I think that's why things are trending upward there. And I looked at their lineup too, and I was like, oh man, it's a really good lineup. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they go really far next year. Not to, uh, Jay, uh, sorry to jump in again, not to put you on the spot, Andrew, because I'm sure you've played for a lot of great people. But, I mean, you mentioned Jim. Is he the nicest guy that you've played for? Like, I, I every, every interaction that I've had with him, um, I, like, not to tell tales out of school, but when I left my job a few months ago, like, he was literally the first person to ring me on the phone after I sent a tweet. Like, yeah. Just yeah. an unbelievable, genuine person. No, he's, he's just, um, that's a great way of putting it. You know, I think he, uh, you know, when you talk with him, when you see him at the ring, uh, even when things aren't going well, there's no issue with, with, with how he approaches you and how he talks to you. And, and, you know, him and bones is always how is your family. And, um, no, they just, it's a good feeling there. I think you're playing for people that, um, you really care about, uh, they care about you and, um, and Jim, he just, it, it's a really, it's a really good spot. I, I, any, anyone that's thinking about signing there, any free agent with, I, I feel like when they come across Dallas, they talk to Jim and, um, uh, they see the operation being run there. I think it's first class for sure. Andrew, now that, you know, you join another organization, being in the league for over a thousand games, you know, obviously I think you got pretty close to your friends in Dallas. Is it easier as you're older because you've played against former teammates or does it become harder because almost every game, maybe you're playing against a guy that you played with and was a good buddy. Does that become more of a challenge or is it more of a motivation because you know him and like most siblings, you want to beat each other up. So does that, is yeah. it easier in essence? How does it work for you? First game is always weird. You know, the first game is always a bit just, I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. You know, like, especially when I went back to Anaheim, like and played the Anaheim guys, it just, you're still kind of talking before the game. You're texting them before the day before. It just feels weird. Um, and then I feel like as you keep playing them, it goes away. So um, I don't know. That's just the nature of the beast. I feel like the NHL is a, it's a funny league. It, it, it's it's a situation. Once you leave a team, you're gone. That's just it. It's just you just move on and and yeah, got to pick yourself up and and get to your new team and and um, and go from there. So, um, but I got a lot of good friends in Dallas. You know what? I'm very fortunate. I I was traded there. Um, being able to play there, I, you know, 
I have two daughters from, from Texas now. And um, it's just a place that wasn't there for too long, but a lot of amazing things happened for me there. Frank had asked Jordan Martinuk this a few weeks ago. So do you excuse yourself from the group chat or do they kick you out of the group chat in that's Dallas? A good, that's a good work? question. I think I'm still in it. <laughs> I actually got a text the other day. Martinuk said they, to... in Carolina at least, like they kind of wait until the next season starts and then they start a new one. So yeah, maybe that's how it I don't work. think we do that. I don't think we do it in Dallas. So maybe I'll just stay in it, see what they do. <laughs> see if they notice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Morgan, yeah. Morgan Ricky just, he said, okay, guys, good luck. And then he took himself out of it before they could reply. So oh, really? <laughs> there's a, all funny ways to do it. Now, as you get ready for your next season, you mentioned your training here. How does your training regime go? Like, are you an on ice guy a lot? Now we're into August already. It seems so crazy because the season yeah. just ended, but now we're into August already. Are you, are you on the ice now more than you ever were before? Or are you on the ice less in the off season? Uh, you know what? Like I, I actually, as the years have gone on here, I feel like being on the ice is pretty important, especially for me now. Um, you know, I used to be a guy where it was like, gym, gym, gym. You had to be in the gym. You had to do this. You had to do this in the gym. And and I don't know. I, I just kind of the last couple of years have said to myself, well, probably should be on the ice more, working on things that you know translate. You know, like I, I, I and I, I kind of am a firm believer in that now. Like I, I think it helps me especially. Like you know, it's tough for me to go. I, I just don't really enjoy going to work out for an hour and a half some days and then going to skate. So, okay. you know, I, I, I think my vision now and, and what I think is I want to feel good on the ice. If I leave the ice and I feel good, well, that's all that matters to me. Right. So I, I, at this point in the summer, I do what I need to do in the gym. I continue to keep my strength. Um, I go in there and um, more to warm up, activate, keep some strength work. Um, and then I want to get on the ice and I think it's important for me. I think, you know, just handling the puck and, and playing in situations. And, um, so yeah, I've kind of adopted that in the last couple of years. Cause I actually see young guys do that. The young guys, they just skate a ton now. They skate a ton and there's gotta be a, a, a rhyme or reason to that because a lot of them are really talented. And a lot of them are really skilled. So, you know, if you're not on the ice, handling the puck and playing with it, you know, you're going to probably lose it. Are you ever practicing the lacrosse move? The kids are all doing no. it, man. All the new, uh, are, no. are you incorporating new drills into your, uh, if you your see me do, repertoire? If, if you see me do that, you know, I'll retire the next day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not a fan of the lacrosse move or what? No, I just, I don't think I could do it. <laughs> oh, okay. But you never tried it. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. All right, let's okay. play a little rapid fire, Jay. Yeah. All right, Andrew. How we like to end our interviews always is uh, we like to have a little fun with rapid fire. You have to answer the question. Sometimes we make it a little bit more of a gut wrencher, but either way, you got to answer it. All right. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. Of all your teammates, who has been your best chirping rival within the locker room that you enjoyed barbing with back and forth? Corey Perry. What made him so good? Well, not didn't make him. I wouldn't say he was good at it. I was just really good at chirping him, so it worked well. <laughs> well, okay. Do you have a favorite Corey Perry chirp? You know what? With him, it was more. He had so many. Perry's has so many superstitions. He does. And listen, I'm not going to chirp him about it because they work. You know, some guys have superstitions. I do too, and that they don't work. But for for pairs, they do. But it was like. Every time in Anaheim, we'd, we'd continually see the, him do the same thing over and again, over again. Pairs would always come off the ice and yell, wakey, wakey, sluggo, who was our trainer. Or sluggo was our, was our equipment manager. The problem was the next year, sluggo was gone. So he kept saying it, but he wasn't even there anymore. <laughs> so, you know, it was like with pairs of me in the room, that was like everyone would wait for me to just jump on, on pairs because – but he was the type of person I would just love it. He would just take it because that's the kind of guy he is. Okay. Um, if you could give one tip to somebody attending their first year college NCAA as a player, what's the one thing you have to do in your rookie year? What's the one thing you got to do in your college, your first year? Honestly, um, that's a good question. Uh, you know what? I'd probably get a good phone plan. I remember my first phone year. I remember my first year in Michigan. I had my phone plan 
And I remember it was a thousand dollars. And I came, I maybe, I think I had a, I think I had a girlfriend back home and my dad came down. I remember him just staring at me, looking at me with this phone bill. And I thought he was going to kill me. But if you think about it, when you go to college, you're, you're still talking to everyone back home in your family. Yeah. And that thing could be, that thing could ring up, ring up real fast. Okay. Hopefully good... now you've repaid him. Oh yeah, I have. <laughs> uh, speaking of that, Andrew, when, when you, when you made it, what was, what was the one gift maybe or something you gave to your parents that, that meant a lot for all their help over the years? Uh, you know what? I think my dad still has my first Jersey. Um, gave my first Jersey. I think we have a plaque with my, um, you know, the first, uh, we actually played San Jose, the first, uh, my first NHL game, the first, first, um, you know, ticket for, to the game. Um, yeah, I think that's what he has. I gave him both those. And, and even for my thousandth game, we made a nice, uh, a nice plaque with some guy did a painting of all kind of my three teams. So he has that too. Uh, someone asked me to ask you this question. You can figure out who, uh, who would be better in a breakaway, Andrew Cogliano or Jason Strudwick? <laughs> Maybe struts. That's the worst part. How many times has he showed you a shootout goal? I've seen it, and I still don't know how we did it, but I've seen it. <laughs> I don't, actually I don't even know how we did that. Like struts, I don't know. He's a piece of work. Oh well, the great part was uh, he was shooting. He was going top blocker and ended up going uh, low opposite side. Yeah. That's what made yeah. it so classic <laughs> about that. Uh, what, still a pretty big shootout goal. John Davidson. Anytime we play that goal, it's so funny. There's so much surprise in John Davidson, who is the color analyst's voice. Yeah, that's what makes the goal even better. Uh, you scored three consecutive overtime goals. How, how superstitious were you? Like, what was the chatter before the third game? Like, were you going on the ice? Like I'm scoring for sure. Like, were you that confident at that point? You know what the worst, the, you know what the funniest part about that whole story was? I had my best chance to score the fourth game. We were in Colorado and we went into overtime again. So that we went, we went four games in a row. Bobby Nielsen had the puck behind the net and passed to me right in the middle of the slot from behind the net. And I remember, I actually just remember seeing the goalie still looking at Bobby and I actually skied the puck into the netting, but that would have been the fourth in a row. So like, I know for a fact we went, we went four overtimes in a row and that was actually my best chance, but they took my stick after the third one. So maybe that That's was, what did maybe it. that was the reason. Oh, you <laughs> should have said, guys, reason. you can't have the stick until I, until the drought, until it's Well, I remember, ends. I remember them coming up to me like, Hey, they want your stick and gloves to the hockey hall of fame. And me thinking, okay, well, the chances is the closest I might the get there. So I got to yeah. send it. <laughs> yeah. And the chance of me scoring overtime again, ain't happening. So yeah, take them. And I actually had the best chance next game. How many teeth are you missing? Two. Are you waiting until your career is over to get them permanent, or do you have like false permanence? I got uh, the two uh, posts in there, so I'll just wait till I get the. I have a flipper, but I just can't wear it. It's just not comfortable. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> lastly, um, which player in, in your career? You talk about guys who helped you early on. Who have you always enjoyed playing the most, and why? Playing against? Yes. It's a good question. Um, oof. I gotta figure out who to put on the spot here. Um, you know what? I'm friends with. I'm kind of friends with them. Is play with Lucas Spiza. Okay. <laughs> and I don't know, but every time I'm out there against them, I forecheck them. I'm always taking the puck off them. I'm always, everything's happening when I'm on the ice with, with Spies. And I always tell him, I'm like, I don't know if it's me or you, um, but it just Probably feels amazing him. when you're on the ice. <laughs> yeah. oh. And you just know it. That's just the confidence. You're like, oh, Spies is out there. I'm getting the puck for sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, I'm on him on the four check. He's a little bit like last two days ago sometimes. And I always had good success against him. How have you played in San Jose? Are you looking forward to being a, a home member of the Shark Tank? Or have you had success there? <laughs> I've had some rough games there. That's for sure. I've had some rough games in the Shark Tank, but um, but yeah, we'll see. It's exciting. I, I think for me, uh, I, I think I'm at a point where I, you know I'm enjoying the experiences, and I want to kind of yeah, 
I think it's exciting to try something new. Well, Cogs, it's always great to catch up with you, man. Uh, continued success uh, in, on a new team in, in a new year. And uh, enjoy the uh, the break from your kids. But I know on another day, you'll be wishing they were there. That's usually how it goes. Uh, you, you like I it agree. for the first night. And then all of a sudden, you're like, geez, where yeah. are those little rodents? I know. Sounds good, guys. Thanks so much, Andrew. All right, guys. Thanks. That was Andrew Cogliano. Really good, dude. Frank, I'm telling you, I will be stunned if Andrew Cogliano four or five years down the road, whenever he retires, is not going to be in management. He's a very articulate person. He's a very deep thinker, looks into stuff. Uh, I firmly believe that Andrew Cogliano is going to start out in player development for an organization, and he'll thrive in that role. You don't make it playing that long in the National Hockey League and continue to play without the love of the game. That was actually what I was most interested in, not to say that a lot of players that play a thousand games don't love it, but uh, I think there's certain guys you come across that you just know uh, it's become a job at that point. And, and those are the guys that don't end up sticking around. So uh, interesting that he kind of knew right away too, that coaching probably isn't for him. Lots of time glued to your laptop. Uh, as you said, seems like more of a, a thinker, a 30,000 foot guy who has a pretty good grasp on everything going on around him. Well, that was uh, episode 54. Once again, we had pre-recorded this uh, last week to have some time off, but we will be back live though on the uh, 16th for another pod and a very special head coach is uh, going to join us in. Uh, Frank, uh, I'll see you in the future. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Saravali and Gregor. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode. Delivered by DoorDash.